So good afternoon, everyone. If you can all take a seat, I think we're going to get going. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you the Associate University Librarian from the University of North Carolina, otherwise known as Will Owen. <laughs> <laughs> and Will and obviously uh, Harvey, who I think he's back at the very, oh, there he is. Will and Harvey, of course, are the great donors of this collection to the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. And the Crossing Cultures exhibition <coughs> celebrates this in such a very profound way. And I'm going to say no more than just saying, Will, take it away. Well, uh, I'm a little overwhelmed at the size of the audience here. I thought I was going to do a small walking tour through the galleries. And I guess that's not going to happen. Um, but at least, you know, there's so many things I love about the hood. Uh, and one of them is that you can stand here and see so much of the art in one um, glimpse. And so I'm going to try to talk to give you the tools and a few reference points so that when you walk through these galleries, um, you might be a little bit more prepared. Um, Although I have to say that the, the, the wall texts that Stephen Gilchrist has done are just fabulous. And if, if you don't usually read wall texts, make an exception this time. He, he, I think he set himself a word limit, that he was only going to write 100 words about each one and give you what you absolutely needed to take away about each work of art. Uh, and it's been uh, an extraordinary uh, experience for me to read these texts. Um, you know, Harvey and I have lived with this art for 20 years, some of it. We bought it because we loved it. We wanted to, you know, our criterion for selecting a painting is, is this something I want to see every day for the next six months or 12 months? Um, and I come here and I'm looking at what Stephen has done and I'm learning more about the art that I've lived with for decades. And so I think that's yet one more wonderful testimony to the things that happen here at The Hood. So uh, a brief introduction to Australian Aboriginal art uh, and our, our journey through it. Um, we um, were both very interested in contemporary American art in the 60s and 70s. Um, Ellsworth Kelly is a favorite artist of mine. In the 80s, we would go up to New York every once in a while and we would see the art that was being shown in the galleries there. And at the end of the day, we would say, why did we do this? We didn't see anything that we liked. And then a friend of ours who had a gallery down in Soho said, there's a show at the Asia Society and you have to go see this. And it was the Dreamings exhibition. And so there are people who have seen it. Well, we went to see it and it was literally a life-changing experience. Um, because what you see here is the result of what happened to us that afternoon. We were so bowled over by the art um, that two years later, we were in Australia and we bought our first painting, took it home, lived with it for three years and went back to buy more. And it sort of hasn't stopped since then. But the first paintings that entranced us were these paintings from the the desert in the center of Australia. Um, they're what are called dot paintings because they're comprised of lots of little dots. And the, the sort of the background of this is that um, all of these paintings relate to, let me just call it sacred matters. Um, and when the men and women engage in the rituals that make them, that bring them in touch with that sort of sacred 
let me stop for a minute, sorry. There's this thing that's called the dreaming or the dream time. And it often sounds like it's a creation period when the ancestors rose up from the earth, created the landscape, sang it into existence, and taught people the ceremonies and the rituals by which they could pass that knowledge of how to live and how to live right, how to live morally on to future generations. But it's not really a creation period that came and went and is over and done with. It's some, someone says that the people have a tense that doesn't exist in English. We have past tense and future tense and present tense. Aboriginal people have this tense that encompasses all of those. And the dreaming is, is imminent in everything that exists at all times. And so when they're performing a ritual, they're actually partaking of that, that ancestral power um, that animates the world. And the men paint their bodies up and they dot themselves with white down, either vegetable down or feather down, and they outline their designs there. And as they dance, the fluff, the down, flies off their bodies. And there's this sense of power emanating out. Um, and when you look at these paintings, at, at almost any of the, the, the paintings, that's what you should be looking for, is how does that power manifest itself visually, optically, off the wall, and kind of into your guts. Um, and, you know, yes, there's a story. This, this is a story about, um, it's called a rain dreaming, and it's about the water in the desert, a great storm that comes up, and, and you see lightning bolts flashing across the sky and water running across the desert. And, and, you know, this is some of the driest land on earth and water is extremely important. And so many of these stories also act as maps. And if you can turn around and see that just that big bright orange painting there, what you've got are a series of circles with lines in between them. It's called the circle and line motif. And it's a way of saying lots of things, okay? From the ancestral point of view, when the ancestors were traveling around creating the country, they camped at various places. And where they camped, significant features of the landscape, often a water hole where you could find, get replenished in the desert. And the stories that they tell tell you how to get from one place to another. So in an oral culture and in a nomadic culture where a family might cover 2,000 square kilometers in the course of a year, you need to know where to find food and you need to know where to find water. And many of these desert paintings tell those stories. <clears throat> and when the old men paint these paintings, if you ever get to see a video of them actually working, you will hear them singing. They're singing the song about how you went from one place to the next place to the next place. And, and when the painting is done, they'll sit and they'll touch it and they'll trace with their hands that movement from one place to the next. And they'll be singing the songs as they touch the canvas. And it, again, it's that in, in that action, you've got that past, present, and future tense happening because they are, they are living that dreaming. And as they sing it, they're teaching it to their children and to their grandchildren. And so it becomes, it's, it's just it's past, present, and future all there together. Um, <clears throat> so this is the art that we first fell in love with. 
uh, and began collecting. Uh, and part of it was that engagement with the story. Part of it was also just the sheer beauty of the work. Um, do you need to know that this is a sacred place where women go when they're ready to give birth? This is a restricted um, hill. Men aren't allowed near here, um, only women, and it's, it's a childbirthing place. If you know that, um, let your imagination run a little bit wild. You may be able to see some more imagery in there. But apart from that, again, it's just the power of the, the way that the image shimmers, that the, the white dots almost jump off the canvas at you. Because after all, there's very few experiences like the experience of giving birth that has that sense of, of generative power, literally, of creation. Um, for many people, this kind of brilliant, almost abstract art um, is the first point of entry. It's accessible, it's, um, it's gorgeous in a very literal sense. But as we spent more and more time traveling around Australia, we began to see that, that this dot painting wasn't all that there was, and it became a very intriguing journey. <clears throat> Probably the next thing that we got hooked on were the paintings that are in that far gallery um, to your left. Um, there are two distinct geographical areas located or represented in that gallery. There's a small group of islands off the north central coast of Australia where people called the Tiwi live. And then in the Northwest, in uh, another very dry desert um, country called the Kimberley, um, the paintings on the back wall and on the side are from the Kimberley. The paintings on the left and the sculpture are from the Tiwi. And again, I'll tell you some stories to sort of hook you into that. Um, there's three paintings, ochre paintings on, on uh, paper stacked up on the wall there. And they tell a Tiwi creation story about Parukapali, who was the first man, and his wife, Bhima, and her, and Parukapali's brother, Tapara. Parukapali and Bhima had a little child named Jinani. And the sad part of the story is that Bhima was fooling around on the side with her husband's brother, Tapara. And they kind of went off into the bush and they left the baby under a palm tree. And as the sun traveled around the sky, he saw that baby had been abandoned. And as his rays moved around, the, they burned the baby to death. And you'll see, that the, you'll see the picture of the baby is black in there. The big bird that you see, the sculpture of the big bird there, the honey eater, told Parukapali that his son had died. And Parukapali was inconsolable. He and Tapara had a great fight. Tapara said, let me have the baby, let me go away for three days, and I'll bring him back to life. I'll bring him back with me alive. And Parukapali said, no, my son has died, and henceforth all men will die. And that, that's how death came into the world. And Parukapali went away into the sky for three days and came back. And Parukapali is associated with the moon. And so that three-day period when he would have gone away is the period of the new moon. Um, and, <clears throat> and this story is told over and over 
in Tiwi painting when Purukapali finally took his son in his arms and said, men are going to die and I'm going to teach you how to die. And he gave the Tiwi people the rituals that they have to perform when someone passes away. And the poles that you see to the left of the bird there, they're called tutini. And they are poles that are carved by relatives of the deceased and placed around the grave. And they're left there um, to weather away and eventually kind of fall over. So they're essentially grave posts. Um, but they're all part of this ritual that's performed um, when someone dies, following the rules and, and guidelines that Purukapali gave to everyone after Jinani died. So the Tiwi work in there is very representative of, again, of this sort of mythological, cosmological explanation for the world. The Warman works, on the other hand, are in some ways very, very contemporary paintings. The big red one that you can see right down at the end of the hall is by an artist named Patty Bedford, who was born in the 1920s, um, not too far from the place that's depicted in um, that painting. And it's a place that's associated with, with the emu, and the emu ancestor. Um, and so you can see the emu there, and those shapes on either side are the hills. And again, there is a, there is a, a sort of a mythological association with death. And, and it's believed that when someone dies, the emu cries out in sorrow and in pain. But what also happened there was, this was an area where cattle ranchers, pastoralists, came, brought their, their herds overland to graze this very rich grassland in the Kimberley. And they essentially displaced the people who had lived there. The, the water holes that were the source of their sustenance became fouled by the cattle or drunk by the cattle and people could no longer sustain their, um, their way of life. They were very, very tightly coupled to the natural environment. And once the cattle came in and disrupted that, they had no way of sustaining themselves. And so they were hunters. And so every once in a while, they would hunt one of these great big horned, four-footed animals that had come with the white man. And as you can imagine, the cattle ranchers didn't take very favorably to this. They were using Aboriginal people as, as essentially um, labor on their cattle ranches, um, but they wouldn't really share the meat with the Aboriginal people. And oftentimes, when they speared a cow for their own sustenance, the ranchers would retaliate by just coming out and shooting a few people. And this site, this emu site, this site that's associated mythologically with death is also the site of a place where many people in the artist's family were massacred in a retaliatory raid by the cattle ranchers. Um, they shot the people, they burned them um, so that there wouldn't be any evidence of the crime that had been committed. Um, and Patty's mother and a few other people managed to escape and, and get away from, from this area. Um, eventually they came back, well, Patty wasn't even born then, but his mother was one of the people who got away. Eventually she came back and started working for the rancher again. And when she had a son, the rancher said, I'm going to name him after myself. He's going to be Patty too. And the ranch was called Bedford Downs. And so Patty Bedford is the artist, 
artist's name. Shortly after Patty was born, though, the Aboriginal people have lots of dogs. Camp dogs are, are like family to them. The rancher decided that the dogs were a nuisance, and so he put out strychnine-laced meat and killed all the dogs, and the people left again and, and never came back. And they went and they moved to a community that, that's called Warman, and that's now the center of this painting activity. And so what you've got in these, these paintings are both um, dreaming stories, sort of these eternal myths of the people, but equally as much a part of that story is this contemporary 20th century historical narrative tied together by this place of death in the paintings. And so again, you have this sense of, of sort of simultaneity, of, of lives lived past, present, and future. Um, and it's just, it's one of the truly extraordinary things as you learn more and more and get deeper and deeper to see how this sort of um, multiple tensed living operates in people's minds. So, how am I doing here? Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this gallery for a moment, and I'm going to take you sort of where we went next from the Tiwi and the Kimberley all the way down to the end of the uh, hall gallery here. And those paintings on bark at the end of the, the gallery. Um, so this is tropical Arnhem Land. It's monsoonal, uh, tropical territory. It's only 11 degrees south of the equator. Um, huge eucalyptus forests. And what they do is they strip the bark off the eucalyptus trees, put it over a fire to make it um, not malleable, that's not the word I want, but flexible, flatten it out, bury it in the sand so it stays flat, and then they cover it with ground up ochre and paint on it with other kinds of ochre. And traditionally they would use things like orchid sap as a binder. Today they pretty much use PVC glue. Um, but they paint with, you, you look at them and you'll see that they're, these paintings are composed of these extraordinarily fine brush strokes and they'll just pull a hair or two out of their head and tie it to a twig, run it through some of this wet ochre and draw that line after line. And the sheer artistry of it is, is exquisite and extraordinary. But again, the point of it is to create, as, as the desert paintings do with their dots, this sort of visual shimmer and this, this um, brilliance is the word that they use that in itself directly communicates to you that power, that spiritual power. Um, <clears throat> literally, those paintings at the back there refer to sacred water holes in the artist's country. And in the north, actually all the way throughout Aboriginal Australia, there is uh, a creature known as the Rainbow Serpent. And the rainbow serpent is associated usually with the onset of um, storms and rain in the northern part, particularly with the onset of the monsoon season. And so you have this enormously powerful snake serpent that can, oops, um, that, that can arch up and cover the entire sky. But most of the time, he lives in the bottom of this water hole. And he's pretty much undisturbed. And there might be 
water lilies floating on the top of the water hole. But when he's down there, you imagine when you look at those paintings that you're looking at the surface of the water. And down at the bottom is this extraordinarily sacred, powerful serpent being whose power is emanating up through the water. And, and what you're seeing is, in one sense, the shimmer of sunlight on the water's surface, or the shimmer, the iridescent shimmer of sunlight on a snake's skin, or simply the power of the rainbow serpent coming up through that water and into your eyes. And again, there's this, this sense of, of layers um, of things that are hidden and things that are exposed to view. Um, there are things that are in the past and things that are in the present. And it, it, the, the sense of, of metaphor of how every, um, every moment and every aspect of life somehow contains more than meets the eye. And it is your job as a human being, as you live life, to learn more and more about what doesn't meet the eye. And so when you're looking at those paintings, you're, that's part of what you're seeing. And, and the surface of the painting in that brilliance is meant to make you feel the imminence of the power that lies just beyond what you can see with your eyes on a sort of mundane daily basis. Um, another story that I'll tell you that's just real cool that I'm really proud of. The painting in the middle there that that woman is standing in front of um, wasn't one of the first Bark paintings, but the, the, the artist, John Mollingel, um, is a very famous Aboriginal artist. He has had a solo retrospective in Basel, in Switzerland. And he was one of eight artists who was selected as part of the, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, so I'm not even going to try, but, um, eight artists were commissioned to create work for the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris, uh, which opened in 2006. It was the, um, it was created, um, it was Chirac's monument to himself and his presidency, and it was created, which I think is really cool. I mean, you know, what would you rather have, a presidential library, you know, the Nixon Library, or a great art museum. You know, I'm gonna go with the French every time, frankly. Um, and Quai Branly was formed by the, the merger of the two main ethnographic museums uh, in Paris. Um, and they invited eight Aboriginal artists to create work that was literally built into the architecture of the administrative wing of the Quai Branly Museum. And so on the second floor, European way, if you go there, you'll see designs like this by Ningara Naparula on the, on the third floor. Um, there's a pole, the first pole that you get to down there, you'll see is covered with stars. Her name is, is we call her Jodora. She passed away recently, so I can't use her real name. The first floor is covered with her stars. Um, if you go into the bookstore and you look up at the ceiling of the bookstore, you'll see that painting. When Mawangel got the commission, he said, that's the one I want to do in Paris. And, and we had to get the thing photographed and sent to the architects. And it was just one of the coolest stories um, in our career as collectors. And of course, we were there in Paris when the whole thing opened. Wouldn't have missed it 
for the world. Um, just moving in a little bit from there, though, you'll see those, um, those feathered poles. Um, those are called morning star poles, and, and they're just exquisitely beautiful. Um, the story is that um, out east of this neck of the woods in Australia, which is called Arnhem Land, there's an island, a mythical island, called Baraku. And it's the island of the dead. It's where people come from and go back to. And out at Baraku, there's an old woman. And every morning, she takes the morning star out of her basket and throws it up into the sky. And it's attached by a string. And as the sun comes around, she starts to pull the string back down. And she puts the star back in her basket for the rest of the day, and then the next morning it comes up again. And so you'll see these bursts of cockatoo feathers at the top of the pole that represent the morning star. And in the ceremonies, they'll tilt the pole at an angle like this, and the strings and the feathers that are attached to it hang down. And those strings, when they are lit, by the light of the morning star form a pathway for the spirits of the deceased to follow out east and back to Baralku. And the feathers represent food that's, all, that's there for them on their journey back to Baralku. Moving up one gallery in the middle there where you can't really see anything except a couple of those wooden poles are works from East Arnhem Land from, from Yolngu people. The Yolngu people are, I think of them as the most philosophically sophisticated bunch of people in Australia. And maybe it's just that they talk more than anybody else. When you read about these paintings, um, they'll say, well, this is the story of a group of women who camped at Marapinti, where they made decorations, bone decorations for their noses. The rest of the story is too sacred to tell you anything. So these desert people are a closed mouth lot. But the young people, they just delight in talking to you about their world and their conception of their world. Um, and a lot of it revolves around water, about fresh water and salt water. There's a painting on the left. It's a great big one by a guy named Water Gumana. Um, and it shows a river. And the course of that river from inland at its source running out into the bay, where in the bottom there are these zigzag lines that represent the waves on the bay. When the monsoons come in, it floods the whole country, and it pushes the fresh water of the river all the way out into the bay. And you, there are spots where you can be out there in a canoe and dip your hand into the water and taste fresh water. When the dry season comes, the process is reversed. The, the river dries up into a series of disconnected water holes and the tide pushes the salt water up into, um, into the inland parts of the river. This dynamic, this back and forth, these two opposite but mutually necessary and ir irretrievably interconnected aspects of life. This is like the heart of Yolngu philosophy. Everything in the Yolngu world is divided into one of two moieties, the Dua or the Yuracha. And one cannot exist without the other. If you are born into a Dua clan, you will marry someone from a Yuracha clan. That's just the way it works. The, we need this complementarity, this balance of opposites in order to live life and to live life properly. 
And, and this notion informs almost everything in Yolmu thought. And it informs almost all of these paintings, which are somehow represent, representations of something like this river, this meeting of fresh water and salt water. Um, and, and the Yolmu are the, are the absolutely most metaphorical people I've ever encountered. Everything has meaning. And again, it's this notion that there is sort of the surface that you see and the meaning that lies behind it. There is the outside story, as they call it, and the inside story. And when you're very young, all you know is the outside story. And as you grow older and wiser and get more teaching from your elders, you learn more and more of the inside story. And eventually, you know enough of the inside story that you can actually make paintings like these and make them correctly. Um, the Olmu, though, are also, perhaps because their lives are permeated with metaphor, are, are, they're just incredibly creative people. Um, and there's a painting back there that if you didn't know better, you might think was an early Robert Ryman. It's just a white painting. And, and it's by a woman named Napa Napa Yunapingu. Um, and she's just, she delights in the act of mark making and in the act of making art. And this is kind of, of revolutionary for Yolmu because everything else that you'll see in there has a very sacred meaning. And Napa Napa has kind of pushed the boundaries and is almost, it's not quite art for art's sake, but it's, it's getting close to it. Um, it's, it's just a very vibrant, creative, you never know what's going to come next out of the community of Yerkala where these people work. The poles that you see in there, just, just very quickly, are, they're, they're art. They are made as art. They're made for the art market. They're meant to be bought and sold to people like me. Um, but they come from Yolmu burial traditions. Um, when after a person dies, they're, they're, they're buried. When the flesh has fallen off the bones, the bones are exhumed and they're put in those hollow logs as a final resting place. And the logs are painted with the clan designs so that the spirit of the deceased person will know how to get back to the country that they came from. So it's a, it's a variation on that idea of the Morning Star Pole in, in the, among this bunch of Yolmu. Um, you go back to the country that your spirit came from or your, your spirit returns to the country that it came from. You may have traveled a long distance in your life, but your spirit will go back and the paintings on those poles help to tell you how to get there. <clears throat> Um, the near gallery, you can see some, you can see a shark and a crocodile and a dingo sculpture there. And off to the side, you'll see a rack of fish hanging. These are from a community called Arakum. If you, you can see on the map there, on the right hand top side, there's this finger that sticks up towards Papua New Guinea. Well, on the east, on the west coast is where the community of Arakun lives. And these sculptures are used in rituals that, again, tell stories from the dream time of the crocodile ancestor or the shark ancestor. Um, and these are pretty much, uh, again, they're, they're modern creations for the art market. But there are some wonderful films. There's a film called Dances at Arakun, which um, was shot about 50 or 60 years ago. 
and it is film of the rituals and it's full of these creatures that they would carry out onto the ritual ground and dance around. And it's, um, it's still um, part of these people's lives as well as being part of their livelihood. And that gets me to one of the um, sort of sadder stories. Many of these communities are way the hell away from everything else. Um, you know, it's 600 kilometers to the next town. And there's like 200 people where you live and you have to travel a few hundred miles to get to your nearest neighbors. You can imagine there's not much in the way of an economy in these towns. The people are desperately poor. They essentially survive um, thanks to um, what I'll call social security payments from the government because there is no unemployment, but the, their attachment to their country, to their land is so strong that it's almost unimaginable for them to move away from that country. This leads to lots of problems in the modern world. Uh, unfortunately, um, with the traditional hunter-gatherer subsistence economy disrupted, um, they are forced to rely in large part upon food that's brought into the community and paid for with their social security benefits. What's unfortunate is that a lot of alcohol comes into these communities as well. And when the communities themselves say, we don't want this, we don't want the grog, the liquor licensing board says, restraint of trade, you can't stop us from selling it. And so there's this, this horrible standoff where people who are unemployed, who are sometimes dispossessed from their from the country that, that rightfully belongs to them. They are living on country that belongs to somebody else, um, which is a, a horrible thing for these people. Um, there's nothing to do, and there's booze. And it's a, it's a recipe for social disaster. And one of the sad things about Arakun is, it, is it's it's in the grip of, of horrible violence, and as well as, as you know, it's alcohol-fueled violence, and it's very, very hard for people to, to stop that from happening because somebody's always willing to sell, them, sell it to them, and somebody's always willing to buy it. And that alcohol-fueled violence is also a theme in another community on the Cape called Lockhart River. And the three paintings along this side of the wall, these brilliant red and blue paintings, are from this community of Lockhart. And, and this is, the Lockhart story is this story of these, these contradictions, um, this hope, this despair all mingled up into one. In many areas, as I've said, um, you get to do this kind of painting when you're old and you've learned the stories and you've learned the traditions and you've learned how to do it properly. And in the Lockhart River area, um, the people basically have been wrenched away from their culture that connection to the stories that their grandparents and their great-grandparents knew has been lost through the process of colonization. And yet, there's still remnants of it. There's rock art in the caves in the area, and people know that. And about 10 years ago, this group of 20-year-olds decided that they were going to do something positive in their community. And with, with some help, they brought in um, a sort of a community college art teacher to start teaching people how to make art that they could sell 
to bring some money and some meaningful employment into the community. And at the time, this was, you know, unheard of, you know, young 20 year old people taking this kind of initiative, taking the painting into their own hands. And they became known as the Lockhart River Art Gang and they were phenomenally successful. And there are three paintings by three women, Samantha Hobson, Fiona Almeno, and Rosella Namak. And they, they sort of, the three, what I like about the way Stephen has hung this, uh, there's so many things that I like about what Stephen has done with this show, but these things sort of tell the story of the community in three different ways. And it's not quite past, present, and future, but, but there's a resonance to it. The middle painting shows these humanoid figures, and these are adapted from the rock art drawings. They're called quinkens of the area. And so to me, that is sort of a little bit of the, um, the past. The past is also kind of present in the painting on the right, which is this sort of loose blue water hole. Um, and it, it's, the, it's the beach and there's rain falling on the beach and the artist is painting um, an image of getting out of the town, getting away from the stress of the community, going down and sitting on the beach with her grandmothers or her aunts, her aunties, and hearing the stories about the past. And she's trying to capture the mood of that peace and quiet on the beach, um, listening to her grandmothers telling her stories. The painting on the left you'll see is this swirl of deep blues and reds and whites, and it's called Wave Break at Night. And again, um, it's this multi-layered story because at one layer, it's sitting on the beach at night. Maybe there's a moon out, maybe there's a star, the stars are out, and you're watching the waves come crashing furiously into the shore. But the other part of the story um, is what she's escaping when she goes down to the beach is the violence in her community, that alcohol-filled violence. Samantha Hobson is the artist's name. She has a whole series of paintings called Bust em Up that's about domestic abuse. And if you step back from this painting of the waves breaking at night and look at it in a slightly different way, what you see is blood and bruising and a different kind of violence depicted in that, um, in that image. Um, you know, is, that's, that's art, you know, I don't know what, by any, by any standard definition. And so this sort of adaptation of the traditional moving sort of closer to what we in the West think of as art is going to take us to the final gallery here on the left, which is mostly photography, watercolor drawing. The artists who are represented in this gallery are people who have grown up in the urban metropolitan areas of Australia, in the big cities, in Sydney, in Brisbane, in Melbourne. Um, and these are people who, again, through the, the history of colonization, have lost touch with their, with their traditional cultures and languages for many, many decades, if not longer. And they are struggling to say, what does it mean to be an Aboriginal person today in Australia? Um, if you were at the symposium yesterday afternoon, several of the speakers made reference to the fact that since the 70s, the government has provided a mechanism whereby Aboriginal people can reclaim the title 
to the lands that their, their grandfathers and great-grandfathers lived on, to their country. But to do so, they have to prove an authentic connection to those kind of century-old traditions. And this is really a double-edged sword because in order to maintain, to, to seize control of their life today, they have to say, well, actually, we've been living in this kind of museum for, we're, we're just primitive people when actually they're not. They've, they've been, it's culture changes. Culture is dynamic and Aboriginal culture continues as these paintings attest to evolve and change through time. And yet somehow to be considered an authentic Aborigine, you have to be living in the past. The, people, the artists who are represented in this gallery live with this conundrum every day. They are 21st century cosmopolitan urban citizens of Australia and they are also Aboriginal and they are struggling to, to say what is my identity as an Aboriginal person in a modern society. Um, on the left hand side you'll see Vernon Aki's Unwritten and it's this series of faceless portraits. It's a portrait, you can tell it's a person and yet you can't quite see the features. And as you move along, they become increasingly less defined. The gaze kind of falls down and, and, and you're, you're left saying, you know, who is this person? Who, who am I? Um, over on the right hand side, there's a great big green photograph this guy is Darren Sewis. He's, a, he's from South Australia, from Adelaide, and it's a wonderfully evocative painting, a photograph. What he's done is he's taken a photograph of this area outside of Adelaide. It's a road, um, crossroads, and there's a triangular sign that you see the back of. And in Australia, that's, well, we would call it a yield sign, in Australia, that sign would say, give way. On top of that photograph of that um, crossroads, which is in itself a significant word, crossroads, he has superimposed this time exposure image of himself. He's an Aboriginal man. He's wearing a white shirt and a tie. He's decked out in contemporary Western dress. But if you look at him, he's also, because of the trick of the photography, you can see through it. He's ghost-like. And you can't really tell whether he's a ghost that's appearing in this crossroads or disappearing from this crossroads. And that's his metaphor for his life as a contemporary Aborigine posted right next to this crossroads with a sign that says, give way. And it's just a, a marvelously evocative piece. It's one of the first photographs, if not the first photograph that we ever bought. On the other side, you've got two pictures looking at one another. One of them is a black and white close up of an old man's face. And the other one is this incredibly sensual um, <coughs> color photograph. And I'm gonna steal something that Stephen pointed out to me. This is one of these, oh my God. The, the old man in the, in the photograph, on, on the black and white photograph, is the artist who made those bonefish sculptures in this gallery. So he's from Cape York, all the way up north. The photographer is an Aboriginal man from Tasmania, the island all the way to the south. AJ, the person in the color portrait, is from the Tiwi Islands all the way in the north, photographed by an Aboriginal woman who was born and raised 
in the Melbourne area, again on the south coast. And so you've got these artists who are, are working across cultures. They're crossing cultures within Australia and from their own roots in the south to working with people in the north. Um, the other thing about the portrait by Bindi Cole of AJ there that I think the didactics explain this to you is this is in the Tiwi Islands and today this AJ is one of a group of about 50 transgendered people who live on the Tiwi Islands. So you'll look at her and she looks beautiful. The photography is beautiful. When you go up and you look at that, check out the way the sunlight flies through the earring and casts a shadow on her neck. It's just an exquisite piece of photography. Um, but essentially, AJ biologically is a man who lives as a woman in Tiwi culture. And this is, there's actually an old Tiwi word for people like this. When the Catholic Church showed up on the Tiwi Islands in the 20s, along with almost everything else about traditional Aboriginal culture, they tried to stamp this out. And the culture has persisted. And these, they call themselves the sister girls. Um, and the sister girls still um, have their place in Tiwi society. And so what you've got is a, is a a woman of mixed Scottish and Aboriginal descent, Bindi Cole, who lives in Melbourne, working with and taking photographs of people who in themselves are crossing cultures, um, but attesting to the survival of an older Tiwi culture in the face of the Catholic Church, in the face of modernization, it's just, you know, it's layer upon layer upon layer of, of crossing cultures. So, um, there's one more gallery over there. And actually, I left that for last because I don't really have stories to tell you about the paintings in there. Um, I, but, when you walk in there, just look at them. Don't worry about what they mean or what they depict, although Stephen's notes will tell you something about them. But they are some of the most simply beautiful visual experiences in this whole exhibition. And I think that's saying a lot because the the beauty of these paintings and, and the variety of beauty in these paintings. I mean, this is one of the things that has sustained us through more than two decades, is every time I turn around, there is something new, there is something unexpected, there is a new way of bringing beauty into the world um, that's found in these paintings and it's beauty that's being brought in and out of oftentimes extreme deprivation, extreme misery, but it comes out of this core uh, connectedness, this sense that past, present, and future are really all one thing. And it, there is a sense of inextinguishable humanity that comes through these paintings and these photographs for me, no matter whether it's the ochre paintings from the Kimberley or the bark paintings um, from the far north or these modern acrylic on canvas paintings from the desert areas. You just, uh, just, those words just came into my mind, but that sense of the inextinguishable humanity of the artists and the people and the communities and the culture that this work 
springs from that is able to reach across another cultural gap, I think, to speak to people like us. I was talking to somebody yesterday um, during the opening reception and she kind of focused on the word contemporary in the name of the exhibition. And in these art critical circles, there's always these controversies about, well, you know, is this traditional or is it contemporary? Well, yes, this is contemporary art. But I think one of the things that makes it hard for us in America sometimes to see that it's contemporary is there's no irony. I mean, if you think about modern art, contemporary art, if you go to museums, if you see it, you know that irony is an almost inextricable part of art in America today. There is no irony in this work. It is sincerity, it is a direct connection. It's like straight from my heart to you, as the song goes. And that is the gift that these artists give to me that keeps me coming back over and over again. And I think that's all I have to say for today. Thank you.